are just like you and I, that they can have conversations with us, they can talk about their desires and their wants. But I just wanted that to be clear. Don't, if your loved one truly has an advanced dementia diagnosis, don't be utilizing the strategies we're talking about today. It's probably gonna be more productive for you to simply take action. That said, we always wanna keep in mind, and I write about this a whole chapter in Cruising Through Caregiving, that the older loved one is still a grown up. Your loved one is still an adult, and we want to treat them with the dignity and respect of them being an adult. So remember, when you do have a conversation with your loved one, your parent, just remember that they are a grown up, they're an adult. I, I really dislike the phrase parenting your parent, and a lot of caregiving experts and, and people say that, and you're not your loved one's parent. You're their child or their grandchild or their niece or their nephew. Your loved one is still grown up, even if there is dementia. So some of the topics that might be you might be thinking about talking about, one, money, finances, another is driving. Should your loved one be driving anymore? Housing options, moving, how is their memory? And this is one, I know in the beginning, we talked just a couple moments ago, if the person has advanced dementia, you probably don't wanna have conversations about should they move or do you wanna bring help into the home? A lot of times you're just gonna take action. But if somebody's in the early stages, you think that they have some memory issues or some cognitive issues, then it can be very relevant to talk to them about getting an assessment, talking to their doctor about their memory issues, and not only to diagnose Alzheimer's or other types of irreversible dementias, but in addition to help them if there were issues that were causing temporary dementia, uh, you know, delirium or different kinds of you know, depression can cause cognitive, cognitive issues for a lot of older adults, medicine side effects. So that's one of the taboo topics I, I'm talking about there. Mental health, if you're concerned about a loved one's mental health, especially right now, uh, I, I just wrote, uh, I just was interviewed for a couple of articles this past week on the mental health impact that the lockdowns and all of the social distancing is having on older adults. And this might be a topic that you are interested in talking to your loved one about. Sex and dating, sometimes people want to have those difficult conversations. And then end of life, dying wishes, death, death and dying wishes, and what you would like for a funeral or what do you need to update your will or trust or advance directive and then a higher level of care this is a very common one that a lot of you will be wanting to share with your parents the concern that maybe it is time for senior living like a bright view so these conversations are so difficult it really does feel unnatural to educate or tell our parents what to do and we want to remember that, again, unless your loved one has advanced dementia, you're probably not going to be telling them what to do. But it might feel like that. So that's one of the reasons it can be so tough. A lot of times it's really hard for us as the adult child to have the conversation because we're not comfortable with the topic. I know I've worked with countless families over the years that they are so nervous to approach their loved one about talking about their depression, maybe depression. And it's because the adult child is, is uncomfortable with the topic. Or mom, with getting help into the home, mom, I can't be over at your house every day cooking dinner and making sure that you don't fall. It might be time for us to get help. You, if you get yourself so nervous, your energy is really contagious to your loved one. And so, it can be really helpful if you get comfortable with the topic. And a big way to do that is to get education about the topic that, and research the topic that you want to broach with your loved one. A lot of times we're seeing the older parent not wanting to discuss the issues. And anybody that's older than baby boomer age, so the traditionalists tend to be private about their health, about their mental health, a lot of times about money. So a lot of times it might be a combination of these issues. Your parent doesn't want to talk to you and you're uncomfortable about the topic. So what we want to do in order to make these conversations simpler and easier and more productive is we want to try to find the right time. So the right time is often not going to be at the holiday dinner table. 
a lot of families feel, well, it's Thanksgiving or it's Christmas or it's Hanukkah or it's the big family New Year's party or a small family New Year's party. I know a lot of people are, are being careful about having smaller groups gather. But a lot of times people feel like, well, all of us are going to be together. This is the right time to have the conversation with mom about maybe moving into a senior living community. You want to be really careful about that because when it's a festive holiday, you don't want to ruin the holiday for your loved one or for yourself. And so maybe if there's the next day or maybe the day before you could have it, or maybe uh, you, you do it on a Zoom call or a phone call after the holidays, sometimes people think, well, the holidays are the perfect time, but just be mindful, especially this year in particular, it's been a really tough time. And if you are having a celebration for the holiday of any sort, you just want it to be as pleasant as possible. Finding the right place. So I always say that I could never have had conversations with my grandmother if it, it, at the kitchen table where she served me meals my whole life, uh, I would never have had a conversation with her about bringing home care in at that table because I would have felt like the kid. I would have felt like the child. I wouldn't have felt like we could have a productive conversation. And sometimes a great place to have those conversations is when you're driving together. And if you have a teenager, you probably know that you get more information from a, a teen, your child, when you're taking them to soccer or swimming or driving them to a friend's house than you might if you're having dinner together. A lot of times kids will say, you say at the end of the day, well, what was your day like? What did you learn in school? And they'll say nothing. And Oftentimes, it's when you're sitting there in, in, a, in a casual environment, like riding to, to the doctor's office or riding to the grocery store, something like that can be maybe a better place. And finding the right energy. I know so many of us are so tired right now. We are, we've got COVID fatigue. We are sick of hearing about the pandemic. And a lot of people are nervous and stressed and angry and worried and having all kinds of different emotions. And right now, I think finding the right energy is more important than ever. So the find the right time, the right place. So if you're an essential worker and you worked all day, double shift, and you don't, you don't necessarily want to have that conversation with your parent after doing a double shift, you probably are depleted and drained, especially if you're also trying to homeschool your child. Finding the right energy is really essential. Another reason that conversations can be difficult is maybe you don't have a quote unquote perfect relationship with your parent. And I know that most people will say, no, of course I don't. But I'm talking about a, you know, nobody has a perfect relationship, but there are many of us who have particularly challenging relationships with our parents. Maybe there was abuse in our past. Maybe that we've been estranged from the parent for a period of time. There can be all kinds of, of maybe there's substance abuse with the parent or a history of, of them not being really interested in maintaining a relationship or they've been really hard on us. And so sometimes it can be, you, you might feel resentful. I feel like I should try to have a conversation with my mom or my dad, but I don't know, do I really owe it to them? But you, you maybe you're out there and you're thinking, well, I, f I would feel guilty if I didn't try to do something. So acknowledge that that is definitely very normal. And again, I just want to clarify that if your older adult has advanced cognitive impairment, advanced Alzheimer's, advanced Lewy body, advanced frontal temporal dementia, advanced vascular dementia, it might not be appropriate to have a taboo topic conversation, it's probably more appropriate to begin to take action. So to be prepared for the conversation, you want to become familiar with some facts and resources about the topic for discussion. So for example, let's say you're interested in, in getting your loved one to update their will, their trust, their advanced directives. Look into that. Maybe look at NALA's website or LCPLFA's website. Those are two great resources. I'm going to ask for Steph to put those in the chat section in case you'd like to look them up. Those are two really great resources ab about elder law attorney services and the, the, you know how to choose an elder law attorney, what kind of documents make sense as we age. So when you get some information or maybe you can look up a few places that are local to you, that you think would be good uh, attorneys that maybe your mom and you could see together. 
But the more that we learn and we are prepared, the more confidence you're going to have going into the conversation, especially if you have discomfort about the topic. I know hardly anybody likes to talk about death and dying. Some people uh, really, really, really have a bad time doing it. So these might be some resources to help you prepare. So driving. So for example, and I'm, again, I'm going to ask Steph to, um, to actually take and cut and paste this into the chat section if she is able to do that. Um, and Stephanie, if you can't, if there's a problem, that's, that's okay. You will be able to access this PowerPoint after the program, I believe. So this, in terms of just, if, if you're worried about your loved one driving and you want to have a conversation like, mom, I, I think it might be appropriate for you to be thinking more about driving. And is this something that you want to stop or maybe just do it during the day or only in familiar areas? Being armed with some of the facts about driving can, and older aging, just being an older driver is actually more dangerous than being a younger driver. And there's a lot of wonderful information in, in particular AARP has the smart driver course. They have the, at, at uh, AAA, uh, the auto club, they have some really great online assessments for older adults. And so that is a really great uh, way to be preparing yourself. The other thing that's nice when you do that kind of prep work is for example, for AARP, they have these smart driver courses, which a lot of insurance companies will give you discounts if you take the class. And I'm guessing that most of them are not doing in person right now, but it might be maybe you're 55 and your mother is 75 and you say, you know what, for the holidays, I'm gonna get you this course and I'm gonna take it with you. We'll both take it on Zoom or whenever we start having in-person events again. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take it and together, and don't make it just because she's getting older. You're both in the uh, over 55 category. You both could benefit from the car insurance uh, discount. And also it would be a nice refresher for your loved ones. So sometimes when you do some of that research, it helps you to have some resources to offer your loved one. Uh, so yeah, and, and then the other one that's really, really, really good is this nhtsa.gov. That one is, is truly excellent. That has some really great information about when in every state where somebody needs to renew or if they need, what, you know, if they need an eye exam or if they need an in-person exam at certain age points or at certain goalposts. And this can be especially helpful if you live in a different state from your parent. So needing a higher level of care. If this is the conversation that you want to have with your loved one, you all, again, want to be really armed with the facts. Don't underestimate the fact that so many older adults assume that when you talk to them about moving, that you're talking about a nursing home. A lot of older adults do not necessarily realize that there are, there is a wide spectrum of different types of, of uh, Besides assisted living, there's a wide spectrum of options that are out there, adult day, home care, hospice, um, and, and senior living, of course, is very, very different from, from all of these. And so if you're talking to your mom about moving and she's visualizing a nursing home where she, you know, she, when she had her mother was elderly, she said, gosh, it was like the worst place I ever was. I just, I, I don't want to go there. I would never want to live there. And just knowing that for a lot of older adults, they have ideas of, of what these services might mean. And so we want to be able to come armed with the facts. If you are interested in having a taboo topic conversation with your loved one about moving, know that moving under the best of circumstances is difficult. I just moved, I just moved to the house that a house that I love. My husband and I are super excited about the, the house. But it was hard, and this is under excellent circumstances. Now, never mind the COVID, of course, that wasn't fun with all the restrictions and everything, but, but we are moving to a house that has better closets, which was a relief to me, that, that a little bit more space, a better view, some really good things. But what's, what's stressful, the packing, the canceling all your utilities, setting up new utilities, figuring out what you're gonna do about cable, are you gonna just do, do that cut the cord, Netflix. So this was a really positive experience for, we wanted to move and it was still a lot of work, a lot of stress. 
Never mind if you are an older person and you're thinking, oh gosh, that sounds so scary to move to senior living. I'm not going to know anybody. I mean, is this going to be my final stop? Am I, am I going to make friends? And especially during COVID, oh gosh, I'm reading that, that a lot of these senior living communities aren't necessarily allowing for people to, to, to have visitors. So all of that compounds what's, what, what's in their mind. Even if it was, they, they were moving to a, a, a beautiful place like a Brightview Senior Living with excellent care and beautiful apartments and great amenities, it's still incredibly difficult. And so you never want to underestimate that. Even though you're thinking, well, gosh, this is great. I would live here. I would love to live here. Just know what you're asking. Even when you know somebody moves to their dream house, it's still really tough. It's still really difficult. Another important observation that you want to make is, is your loved one being propped up by you or others? A lot of times, I, I, a lot of times family members are propping up their loved one and their loved one assumes, I'm fine, I'm functioning independently, everything is great. But really it's because one daughter brings dinner every night and one daughter brings uh, the medication from the pharmacy and the other son brings him to, them to the doctor and and then when there's a fall in the middle of the night a grandkid goes over and these things have happened in my very own family so this and I'm sure in a lot of your families this is going on but your loved one just as under the impression that I don't know what you're talking about I don't know why I would need home care I don't know why I would need adult day I don't know why I would need senior living I'm doing fine so know that that can be a barrier. When, when I'm not saying that you just leave your loved one to fend for himself or herself and never help them, but know that if you're doing a lot to prop up your loved one, it may be that he or she is never going to be receptive to the idea of some of these options that you might suggest. Sometimes withdrawing some support can be a good strategy for breaking through denial. When my grandma was sick and she, we were trying to convince her that she needed home care, she would, she would get really angry and she would say, well, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm completely fine. And she wasn't completely fine because all the examples that I just gave, someone was driving her to the doctor. She was calling everybody in the middle of the night. If she fell, she wasn't comfortable in her house without somebody being there. And I remember one of the times it was my shift, we all took turns spending time with her. And I said, I had the conversation, I was having this difficult taboo topic conversation about, it's really, we need to have this conversation about home care. And she said to me, I'm completely fine. And I said, well, what am I doing here right now? And she's like, well, you're visiting. And I said, right, I'm visiting, I'm spending the night, we're spending time together, but are you going to want me to walk you to the bathroom? And she says, well, yeah, if you're here. I said, let's, let's try this. Can you get yourself to the bathroom? If you need a glass of water, can you, can you get that for yourself? Let, can you try? If you, if you feel like you can do it and I'm just here visiting, show me that you can do it. And it didn't take long, but it wound up to be a very, very difficult night with her because when I said that and I challenged her to, to girl, go ahead, I'm just visiting, go get your glass of water or go get your medicine. And the frustration and the, the sadness in her face was just so hard to, to, to deal with. I mean, it, because it was hard to, to say to her, listen, I'm not just visiting because I love my grandmother and we were very, very close. But for the sake of the entire family, we had to say something. People were missing work. People were uh, not sleeping at their own homes with their spouses and their kids. It, it, we were all disrupting our lives. And if that's temporary, if, if this was, she had a, a temporary illness that she, you know, a couple weeks or a couple months or even six months that she needed us around the clock, that would be one thing, but we were looking at it indefinitely with all the different health conditions that she had, it was going to be indefinite. And so we ultimately did have that conversation about home care and then eventually for senior living. We want to remember that you are going to have denial. There's nobody on this program or anybody in existence 
that has not been in denial at some, at some point about something or another. Why does denial exist? Our denial exists because our brain is not ready to accept something. And so remember that when you bring up a first conversation that you have with a loved one about stopping driving or their mental health or moving to senior living, a lot of times there's going to be much like with my grandmother, denial. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm completely fine. There's no issue here. There, your brain is trying to protect yourself from a change or a confrontation that you don't want to deal with. And when I say a confrontation, I don't mean that you're being argumentative, but the brain doesn't want to confront the fact that hmm, I've been in six Fender benders in the last two months, maybe it is time to start looking at, do I, do I have my loved ones drive me? Do I take Ubers? How do, you know, what are the other options for me getting around? When you decide you're going to have one of these difficult conversations, you want to think about what is your outcome? What's your goal? Are you just trying to introduce the topic or by the end of the time you speak to your loved one, are you going to want them to agree to visit two communities that might be a good fit for them? Who should be the communicator? Now, I know a lot of times in a lot of families, it's sort of this automatic, well, it should be the oldest child or it should be the, the daughter that lives closest. Sometimes the best communicator is not necessarily that simple. Sometimes it can be an adult child or a grandchild or a friend of the family. Sometimes it's somebody that they're not as close to the situation because they have more objectivity. Sometimes it's a faith leader. Sometimes it's a doctor but, or, or an attorney. But sometimes the person closest, whether it be geographically or, or emotionally, is not always the best communicator. So who should be? Somebody a little removed. Somebody that's considered to be an authority figure in the family, or sometimes even an authority figure outside the family. And so I'm wondering if anybody has any comments or questions or has any examples about how they've been doing it or what they're thinking about. Who, who, do, who do you think is the best communicator in your family? Now, I will tell you, I was the communicator with my grandmother for a lot. Myself and my, my one of my uncles did a lot of the communicating. And for one, it was because my, my aunts and my dad would become very emotional about it. And even though I was really close to my grandmother, I had a different relationship. And I could take a step back and say, what's going on right now is impacting the health and mental health of this entire family. And so we need to find other solutions that don't involve everyone in the family sleeping over every night of the week. So it's really very, very important to be thinking about, is the person that you've identified to communicate the right person? So we talked about don't pick the wrong place, pick a neutral place, maybe taking a walk, maybe driving in a car together. Be really careful at the holidays. We talked about that maybe at the Christmas or Hanukkah table is maybe not the best or on mom's birthday. These might not be, even though you might think, well, we've got, if you're, if you're having a gathering, uh, even of a small gathering, well, there's going to be two of the three sisters here and mom will be here. Let's bring it up. Just be mindful. You want the holiday to still be pleasant. And it doesn't mean you can't do it the day before or the day after, but, and, and, and you want to also be mindful that sometimes it is a good idea to have multiple people in the family talk to your loved one, but sometimes it may not be good to have it all at the same time. You might not want, the person might feel like they're being ganged up on a little bit. Be careful about distractions. Cell phones, work, and small children, and noises. And I know that many of you are saying, are you kidding me? This is my life now. Because it seems like nobody has any privacy anymore unless, it, really, because so many of us are at home with loved ones, with work from home, spouses sharing the internet, children trying to learn online. And so this is a tall order. But if you want to have a serious conversation, you want to try to have as little distraction as possible so you can give your full attention to your loved one. Don't make assumptions. 
you as a family member don't know everything in your parents' mind. You might think that you do. It's so funny that family members often think, well, I know exactly how my dad's going to react to this comment or question. I know exactly what, what they are feeling. And you don't. You, you really, really don't. It's, it might be surprising that you may make the assumption that, oh my gosh, I'm going to bring up going to an elder law attorney and mom's going to think I, I'm after her money or something, or, or that I, I hope she dies soon or something like that. And it could very well be that she was thinking the same thing, that she's like, you know what, I really have, have to make a new will. I haven't done that in a long time. And there are new great grandchildren that I need to add into, into the paperwork. So don't assume that you know everything that is going on in, in your loved one's mind. Try to be patient and persistent. Remember that everybody has gone and had denial in their life. We've all experienced denial. And your brain is protecting you from something that you are not ready to deal with or that you are not ready to face. And so know that unless there's an emergency situation, you got to practice patience and persistence. You want to try to put yourself in your loved one's shoes. How would you feel if someone approached you and said, you know, I don't really know if you should be driving anymore, or you really need to think about moving out of the home that you've lived in for the last 60 years. Those would be really tough conversations to have. Uh, interesting. Somebody just wrote in uh, different topics, different point person. I do all the healthcare. My sister does all the finance. Right, and I think that that is such a good way to do it. D the different people have the, their different lanes that they, maybe they're better at than somebody else, and it's it it makes it so it's not all falling on one person's, which is which is great. Know that you're probably going to have to have conversations with your loved one more than once. Wouldn't it be great? I know that a lot of us feel like, well, if I talk to my mom about her needing home care. Well, this will be great because then you know we'll have somebody come in the next day and do an assessment, especially if your loved one does not have Alzheimer's or dementia, they really do get the final say. And so you might have to have this conversation a couple of times. Now, that said, even though they get the final say, that doesn't mean that you need to be over there all day, every day, doing everything. You also are a grown up. Choose your battles. Just be really, really mindful that you don't necessarily want to pile all of your requests in one conversation and choose the battle that you think is most relevant, most important. If it's that you want to get your loved one an assessment for their memory, and that's the goal, don't get into, well, and if something's wrong with your memory, we need to, we need to move you. Start small, choose your battles. And having these conversations at all is an enormous success because what we're trying to do, and I know you all are trying to do this, is you're trying to prevent a crisis. And for Stephanie and Karen and I, all of us have worked in this field a really long time, and we see crises every single day. And somebody didn't make the decision, somebody fell, somebody didn't get help in time in the home, or they didn't move to senior living in time, and they kind of missed their window, and now they have to go to a nursing home or, or they, they drove and now they, they had a really, really bad car accident because we saw the signs. But know that you're going to try to have these conversations and even you might have to wait for a crisis because it might be that you have a very stubborn loved one who doesn't want to take any action. But at least when there's a crisis, you'll have had some conversations. You'll have gotten some of their thoughts and feelings. We want to avoid a crisis, but just know you don't always avoid a crisis because you're dealing with flawed, imperfect human beings who do have their own wills. Remember all that might impact their reaction to a conversation if there's mental health, if there's been a recent loss, especially with all this COVID going on right now. This is at the forefront of everybody's mind, and that can certainly impact somebody's reaction. Look for natural openings. And natural openings might be maybe they have a neighbor that just moved to a senior living community and that's not, how does she like it? Have you been over to visit her? And I know right now with COVID, probably not, but, but have you heard from her? Have you talked to her on the phone? 
but look for natural openings when you see something in the news, for example, that, so uh, Sandra Justice, uh, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor uh, talked about her memory publicly, and she talked about, before she was diagnosed with dementia, she talked a lot about her husband. And interestingly, that is, if that's something that's in the news and something that's newsworthy and that people are, you know, more and more people are being open about being caregivers, uh, that there are a lot of celebrities and public figures, if you see something on the news together or you, you, you can bring it up, if she's a fan of, of a certain person, that might be a really good way to have that natural opening. Know the limits of your power so often. So I know that a lot of you are saying, well, I'm the healthcare power of attorney. I'm the financial power of attorney. I'm that. You are probably not in charge until your loved one is incapacitated, depending on how the document is written. And so, so often families will say, and I'm sure Karen and Stephanie can tell you this happens quite frequently. I have the power of attorney. Well, your mom is still walking and talking and she's cognitively intact. And so you really don't have any power at all. It's still your mom's decision. So you want to talk to them, but you also want to know that you, how you, uh, you deal with that. Um, we have somebody asking if a family member does not, does need a place like Brightview. So that's all I can see uh, for the person that just wrote in. If a family does need a place like Brightview, so if you would go ahead and give us your question a little bit more detail, we'd love to answer that. Model the behavior you want your parent to emulate. So one thing that I did with my dad is I went to get my advanced directives and well done. And I said to him, I just did mine. Why don't you do yours? Because I really, and, and I have to tell you, my dad died three and a half years ago. And I'm so grateful that I did press him to do it because we knew exactly what he did and did not want upon his death. He was so specific. And, but, but that can be a very powerful way to request of, make the request of your loved one. Maybe you've struggled with depression or anxiety and you're observing that in your loved one. Maybe you say, look, I'm gonna talk to my doctor about my anxiety. Or my depression and every so many people were dealing with mental health crises right now because of covid or the example that i gave earlier about the aarp smart driving course model we'll do it together let's model the behavior that you want your loved one to emulate so again the example like valerie harper with hospice her husband not wanting hospice and i believe that that was truly a reason because he didn't understand what hospice was and he was he was interviewed and quoted about not giving up. And we know if, if you have any experience with hospice that you know that hospice is, is just a wonderful service for people who have a terminal diagnosis. Or Robin Williams' death anniversary, if you're worried about your loved one's depression or you're, you're, you're worried about their suicide risk if they've had suicidal tendencies or thoughts in the past. So all of that is, again, thinking about those natural openings and look for those types of of openings on on your in your news in your social media feeds involve others who care about your loved one again it does not necessarily need to be just you and it, and your loved one it probably you're going to want to involve friends and neighbors and especially if it's something very serious that you're trying to encourage your loved one to do or to change and seek people from your faith community, seek people in the health and, and mental health that are involved with your loved one. Explain how it's impacting you and others. When I had the conversation with my grandmother, I gave her specific examples about how it was impacting my dad and my aunts because they had the bulk of taking care of her. They were staying at her house more than anybody else and I said, this one's not sleeping. This one's having her arthritis act up. This one's having, it not hasn't spent the night with her husband in such and such period of time. And I gave specific examples. And this was not to try to guilt my grandmother. This was not to try to make her feel bad. I think it probably did, but it was about, look, we're not just having this conversation about home care for just because we're trying to be pests. We genuinely 
when we're burning out, we're not able to give you what you deserve as far as care. Um, so the question was, if a family member does need a place like Brightview, uh, their fear is being isolated because of COVID and why we hesitate to bring in a place like Brightview. So Stephanie, if you would, um, the, if you're able to, and if you're not, it's okay, don't worry. Uh, but if you are able to uh, pull up the article that I posted on Facebook today, the one about isolation during COVID, um, it's, it's on my homepage. Uh, it's on all of the sites, but if you could post that. So it's interesting, Rosalind, I actually just got interviewed by a news outlet about this very issue. And here's the thing, for some people, and I'm gonna invite Karen to, to comment on this if she would like. So Karen, if you would like to comment on this as well, feel free to turn on your camera, feel free to, or if you wanna write in, that's great also. So thank you so much, Stephanie. So the, the article that I was interviewed for, and this is actually the first in a series of two, but a lot of people do have that worry right now. And for some people that uh, the, it, moving to senior living actually is gonna be better for them than being home because even if the activities are not exactly what they were back in March of 2020, they're still doing activities. They're still doing programs as, as much as they possibly can. And I'm not, again, I'm not saying it's exactly looking like what it did in March of 2020, but the other, the other thing that helps, especially if this person lived alone or if they are only living with one other person, they're seeing staff. They're, they're, I mean, they're definitely gonna be seeing staff. So there is, is it gonna be exactly how it was in March? No, but they are still engaging with the residents' activities, programs, and it, it, they also definitely are seeing staff. So people who really need to consider this, if there's a dementia diagnosis and if there's danger, for example, the person is wandering, if the person is leaving the stove on, if the family caregivers are so burnt out from taking care of the loved one that they can't give good care anymore, your loved one probably is better off in a Brightview senior living. So Karen popped on, I'm gonna turn the rest over to her. <laughs> so I'm gonna turn off my camera for a moment. Okay, I just wanted to agree with what Jennifer you were saying that we have spent a lot of, of time and it's a high priority to make sure that number one our residents are safe and that they're in a environment that is that puts their health and wellness and every single precaution in place puts that first, uh, but a close second is having our residents still engaged and still socializing because we did have that time where we shut down and everyone was invited to stay in their apartment home uh, during end of March into July. And you definitely see the impact of isolation and us seeing that and not wanting our residents to experiencing that again, to experience that again. We've been very, very vigilant on keeping everybody socially distant. We've rearranged the way we do dining. We've rearranged the way we do activities uh, and, and, any, and, and we have put some precautions in place that don't allow for us to do everything we were doing, like Jen said, but I can def I'm sitting at a community right now and I can tell you that there are residents that are meeting with their families, they're together. Um, life is, is happening again at our communities and I'm so proud to be able to, to say that about everyone. That's, that's our leadership and everyone working to make sure our residents are still getting, getting the best that they can, that they wouldn't be able to get if they were home by themselves. Absolutely, Karen. And thank you so much for sharing that. We really appreciate it. And I've worked with Brightview a very long time and the commitment that they have to their residents and the quality of life that they bring is just really tremendous. So I, I just encourage the person that asked that question just to, to talk to the staff that talk, you know, make an appointment, do a virtual tour, and there's no commitment. Just ask those questions and and you know give give scenarios like if my mom likes to play cards or if my mom really wants to be in a book club of what what are the programs that are available but just you know there's no obligation they'll take the time to walk through it with you and yeah the person who asked this question said that what i just described 
of it, about reasons that maybe it is time are, are happening to you. So yeah, please just consider talking to Karen and the team, the teams. And uh, if you want to share your information with Karen, I'm sure she uh, can arrange for someone to talk with you. And um, I can put my information up at the end. Jen great. Has that. great. Awesome. All right. So thank you. And again, it's, it's definitely something to think about. We can't, we don't want to act like that elephant isn't in the room. It's definitely something, but you know, there's going to be a vaccine soon and hopefully we're going to be moving much toward things being much more like they were back, um, back uh, ten, nine, ten months ago. Remember, <laughs> this is so tough and I feel like I always have to say this so many times to families. Your loved one makes the final decision if he or she is legally competent and has capacity. Your older loved one is a grown up. You can make your case, you can share resources and examples, but you have to remember and you have to treat that person with respect. And I know it can be really tough, but if there's, now listen, if there's advanced dementia, this is very different, but please keep in mind that they do have to make that decision and you want to avoid a crisis and we're hoping that you do help them avoid a crisis but sometimes you didn't fail if you got to a crisis it might be that your loved one is that particular stubborn kind of uh parent that that it's you just want to do the best that you can just do the best that you can we, but mid-stage Alzheimer's or other dementias, you almost always just have to take the reins. You have to decide, you have to be at the helm. Sometimes, again, I talked about withdrawing support, not to be mean, and don't do this with somebody with dementia. If somebody has dementia, you need to just simply take action. You don't wanna withdraw support. But if someone doesn't have dementia and they're not open to the suggestions and the ideas that you're bringing, it, sometimes it might be to keep yourself sane. Maybe, mom, I can only bring dinner twice a week. I can't bring it every single night. So I want to thank Brightview Senior Living for sponsoring our program today. And I want to encourage anybody, any, have, and we do have some extra minutes, some time here. If anybody has any comments or questions or examples, or if they have questions for Karen or myself, please feel free to write in anything that you would like to share, anything that you would like to ask. And if you are interested in a free copy, a free chapter of Cruising Through Caregiving, if you would go to cruisingthroughcaregiving.com, you'll get all the worksheets for that, that are involved in the book. You'll get um, hard copies of the worksheets that you can use, that you can, you can copy them to use for your family. But thank you all so very much. I know caregiving is always difficult. It is always challenging. And this time that we are living in is not making it any easier. So I wish you all well, and I hope you stay well and safe during this holiday season. And remember, if the first conversation doesn't go perfectly, you always get another chance. Be persistent and be patient. Thank you all so much. Jen, I just wanted to hop in before everyone um, hangs up that I did see a question about just the hesitation about moving to a break view because of COVID, kind of addressed that and wanted to, to get back to that a little bit and completely appreciate that concern. And certainly we hear a lot of statistics out there. Um, now, difference between a break view and a nursing home is that nursing home has a higher level of uh, care needs. So people who live there are um, more frail. The health um, situation is, is, is not as, as positive as you might see at a Brightview. Uh, also, there are more people coming into a nursing home than we allow for at Brightview, especially at this time. Uh, but again, Jen, where you were going with it earlier is that we have precautions in place. Anyone that walks in the door has to get their temperature taken and, and fill out the screening questions that you're probably familiar with if you're venturing out anywhere. We have a video that people need to watch about maintaining social distance and wearing their masks. Uh, you can see me here at the community. This is how we are. And actually the regional team is being fitted for N95s uh, this and next week so that we can continue to support our communities in the safest way possible. Um, you name it, we've done it. Um, anytime our tables for dining are, are six feet apart and then eight feet apart from the next table, 
We've done roaming happy hours so that our residents aren't mixing together. If they are, we're making sure that they're socially distant. We've actually hired people during this time when a lot of people are getting laid off. Um, we've, we've been able to hire a number, a, a huge amount of people that uh, in order to help keep our residents engaged, we call them hospitality assistants. So they've been helping with delivering packages and keeping um, our residents engaged and making sure that they're coming out for meals and participating in activities and events and our families are able to visit. So depending on where the community is within um, and where their COVID levels are in that region, in that market, uh, we can either do, most of the time we are doing indoor visits at this time. Some cases we are doing outdoor visits and I was in the middle of uh, talking to someone about getting heaters for a few of our communities so that outside visits can continue to take place throughout the colder months. So we appreciate the importance of our residents seeing their family members. I will say that, because a lot of times this comes up, we have um, uh, two negative COVID tests that need to happen before a resident can um, join the, the greater community. So when somebody moves in new to our community, as Jen said, we offer virtual personal visits as well as in-person virtual visits. So whatever you're most comfortable with. And when the resident is moving into the apartment home, we do ask that there's a COVID test taken before they move in. And then one COVID test that we administer after they are in their apartment home. And once those two negative test results are back, then they are free to, to move about the community as anyone else would be. Um, again, family visits can take place after that time. While they are in, invited to stay in their apartment home waiting for those two visits, they, or I'm sorry, waiting for those two negative test results, I can assure you they are not alone. They are still getting brought really great meals. One of our communities is, is presenting it on China and very, uh, very specific to the needs of the resident. We're making sure that they're getting everything they need. They can still have a support person or two come in to help them with the move. So I know that's scary to have a loved one move into a place and not be able to see them. Uh, but move in day, there is, a, there is a support person and we are working on being able to continue that support person's visit. We don't have that done yet, but we're working on that just to, to maintain the, the um, level of engagement that we want our residents to have. So I, um, am I allowed to share my screen? Cause I have my number I can put on there in case anyone has any questions. Yes, you're allowed. Okay. Um, how do I do that? Let's see. You're just going to go down to the bottom where it says share screen and there's a little okay. arrow. It's <laughs> <That's> easy. <laughs> All right. Let me just pull this up real quick. All right, there you go. So there, can everyone see that? My name, Karen Williams, Regional Sales Manager. Yes. There's my email address, and under there is my cell phone number. Please don't hesitate to call. Uh, I know a few of you have already in inquired about specific communities like Brightview Towson, uh, Brightview Mace Chapel Ridge. So you're in great hands with those sales directors. They are, they care so much about the safety of anyone coming into the community for a visit, they understand that it can be a little nerve wracking. So talk to them about options. And um, we are there, I do have a slide here, I won't get into it, but there, there are statistics that we at Brightview have a more, um, I've, if you look at the, the greater count of COVID tests at Brightview, at Brightview because we've had such precautions in place, we actually have lower cases than what you would see out in the greater community. So if that helps with peace of mind, I'd be happy to share that information with you. If you can email me, I can send that over. So um, I appreciate everything that you're doing and please don't hesitate to reach out to me or the sales director at the community you're interested in and we can help you navigate this process. Karen, we have another question. Yeah. Uh, how well does a family member adjust to not seeing their family during quarantine? I think it depends on, on the person, quite honestly. Um, again, we have a lot of residents who they'll do FaceTime with their loved one. Um, they can also, we've actually had some, it's getting a little colder now, but during the, the warmer months, and even now would be fine. We have 
some residents that are on the first floor that can still do that visit, but outside through the window, something like that. But it really isn't, we've worked really hard to make it a short time. So you figure right now in order to get two negative results back, don't quote me on this because it does de depend, um, but I would say it's about five days, five to seven days to be safe. Um, and where it used to be when we started doing this back in July and opened up again, it was, it was a much longer time. But now it's, I would say on average five days to get those results back. So it's just that amount of time that someone is asked to stay in their apartment home. But like I said, we have, we are very particular about our department heads going to visit that person. We make sure they have really great meals. We make sure that they know exactly what's happening in the community so that when it is time for, when they do have those negative tests back, they can join the community as if they're already, because they are already part of it. We actually have some communities, actually I think all communities that have resident ambassadors who are ones who have been with us for a while and know how the community works and we have them call um, the new resident to welcome them through the, via the phone or through FaceTime. So our, our leadership has been at the communities have just been amazing about out of the box ways idea, out of the box ideas that we can engage our residents even within the first move in, move, move in day that they have. So pretty, so to answer your question, Honestly, I would say pretty well, considering they're still seeing and encountering a lot of people. Um, but that really depends on the person, how they, how they transition anytime, whether it's COVID or not COVID. And I'm just going to throw in a couple of thoughts for, for you as a family member. If you're worried about your own transition, and frankly, Stephanie and Karen and I can tell you, families sometimes have a harder time with the transition than the residents do under normal circumstances. But it might be appropriate to, if you have a, a, a therapist that you work with, or maybe tell your friends that you're going to need extra support, you know, phone calls and Zoom happy hours or social distance walks or whatever it is that you do to take care of yourself, because it, it's going to be, there's going to be a space in your life that you're not filling in. You probably were doing, if you are currently doing a whole bunch for your loved one, or you're constantly checking in on them, there's going to be some space. So I would say, you know, are you going to make an appointment to get a massage or you know, do some things, get yourself, get some books out of the library. What, what are you going to do that you will fill that time that maybe is going to be less about taking care of your loved one and maybe seek support from friends if you have a therapist or you want to consider working with a therapist. But, but those are just a couple of other thoughts on that. And with that, Jen, we, we do it right. You have some of our communities offer support groups for, for, those, for those family members who have moved a loved one in and they just need to help navigating that, that change in their lives. So we, we do offer that virtual um, right now. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, thank you all so much. I'm gonna turn it over to Stephanie and she's gonna wrap us up. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to Jennifer. Thanks to Karen. What a great conversation. What um, some really great questions and points that were made. Um, we really, really do appreciate uh, Karen Williams from Brightview for making herself available and um, sponsoring today's program. There will be a link that you receive if you don't mind just doing a quick survey, a uh, quick evaluation of our program. That'd be great. And in the comment section, I did put in the link for you if you're interested in getting a chapter of Cruising Through Caregiving. That link is also available to you. Um, so thank you so much for the time you've afforded yourself today. And thanks to Jen and to Karen for um, what a great, just a great discussion and lots of great, wonderful, helpful information. Wishing you all a terrific, safe, healthy holiday season.